Hey everyone, back on TikTok Live and going to be recording this video to then go ahead and put on the YouTube channel and uh, also on the Instagram channel. All of them under the Tattooed Zookeeper, the same moniker that I have here up on TikTok. Um, now I've done a couple of videos recently. I did a hamster one, I did a parakeet one. Um, and normally I'm a reptile guy. Uh, most of the time I'm doing stuff on reptile info, reptile care. Um, but my department also has small animals in it as well as inverts. Um, so I don't feature small animals really all that much. So today we're going to talk about gerbils and I actually have two gerbils in here. Um, Carlo, uh, sorry, Carla and Claude and they're little rascals. So hopefully they'll go ahead and let me pick one of them up. Come here, buddy. Ugh. Here we go. This is Claude. Claude is a domesticated gerbil and in case you didn't know, Majority of gerbils, uh, because there's 110 different species, uh, the domesticated ones originate from the Mongolian gerbil. Um, so this is a gerbil that's found in uh, parts of China, uh, Central Asia, even all the way over to the Middle East. Now, because of that, the type of environments they like to live in are actually pretty arid. Uh, so just like when we talked about hamsters, uh, these guys actually live in a lot of desert-like conditions. So gerbils love having lots of things to burrow in so when we keep them in an enclosure and here at the store we actually use tanks rather than using like your traditional plastic cages or ones with metal bars is so we can give them deeper substrate to go into so the plastic ones don't work because they just chew their way like right out of it uh gerbils can chew through just about anything if you give them enough time just like rats and other like larger rodents reason we don't keep them in cages with bars is because we want to give them substrate to be able to bury in. So this breeding pair, uh, we keep in a 20 gallon long and we use a mixture of care fresh and we use hay. We typically go about eight inches high or so. Um, we have done bioactive exhibits with these guys where we use some bio dude substrate and also use some desert blend. And we'll also go like six to eight inches deep, sometimes 10. Uh, to give them lots of area to be able to burrow through in there. More area you give them, the more burrowing uh, substrate, the better off they do because they come really happy. They can go ahead and make like all these different like connecting burrows. They can make foodstuffs, places to go to their houses and everything else. Now in the wild, they live in very large groups uh, and they're mainly patriarchal um, with the main female uh, being the only real breeder in all of that. Um, and usually just keeps their newest litter in with them and then eventually all those guys start to spread out. Um, but as you can see, they can be pretty calm animals if you give them some time. Normally I think of them as the hyperactive like ADHD kid, uh, but once they get used to you, they do really, really well. Um, they have an incredible sense of smell and hearing and eyesight. Uh, being that they're a prey item and almost everything in their environment is always looking for extra food, these guys are a main food item where they're from. So they have all these senses that really help them out. Now, interestingly enough, they can make a variety of sounds, like all kinds of squeak, squeaks, hips, uh, and like whistle type sounds, but they also do a lot of foot thumping. So their large ears really help them be able to pick up on all that stuff, but they'll also be able to feel the vibration from the foot tapping. And so they have different ways of communicating with each other, especially within their clan, to kind of know who's out there and what's going on based on all those different sounds and all those foot thumpings. Um, now, like I said, very, very hyperactive animals. So we also put a wheel in there for them to run on. Um, sometimes we use wire wheels, which we don't always recommend anymore. I actually am more prone to try to go for something that they can't get toes caught in. But it's hard with an animal like this that loves to chew so much. There is a type of wheel out there called a, I think it's a silent whisperer is what they call it, but it's a type of wood. And that's really great for them too, but you do have to be weary that they are just gonna chew their way like right through it eventually, because even with their house, you can see they've chewed all the doors right off of their house as well. So they make really quick work of anything that's wooden, but that's also why we offer up so many pieces of enrichment for them. There should always be something there for the chew on. And really you should be you know, changing that out every 12 to 24 hours and putting a piece of something else in there. Because just like a dog, they'll get bored with their toys. So you need to be offering them a pretty good variety. Um, so gerbils originated from 46 individuals that came to the United States in, I think it was 1936 or 1937, if I read it correctly. 
they were first really discovered in like 1800 and really identified in 1866, but they became a staple uh, pet uh, going into the 40s and 50s. So again, when they were first brought to this country in the 30s, it was, uh, I think, 26 males and 20 females or, or vice versa. But it really was just like 46 individual gerbils were brought to the country and then all of them are based off of those guys right there. Now, you can see he's already starting to calm down because he knows me, he knows my smell. I take care of him 40 hours a week. Um, and then once he gets to a comfortable spot, you can go ahead and just start petting him like you would any other animal. The other thing that helps too, is they do like tight spaces like a lot of other rodents. You don't wanna squeeze them. You notice like my hand is still slightly open, but I give him the chance to kind of feel like he's in a cave and feel like he has the ability to dictate if he wants to move in and out and he has the space to move around. But then this just makes it easier to like go ahead and pet him. And just like with any other animal has like good sensory, especially whiskers, they can pick up on your pheromones. They can go ahead and tell like uh, what kind of mood you're in. They can really kind of determine whether or not you're a predator and trying to harm them. So as long as you're showing them no harm, even doing like a little bit of grooming habits, like just petting his ears and stuff, he's just closing his eyes and doing completely okay with it. This can make them an okay uh, pet uh, for little kids. Usually for really, really little kids, I suggest something more like guinea pigs or rats that have uh, a little bit bigger, less likely to harm, um, a little bit more personality. But you know, if you're getting, if you have kids that are around like maybe eight to 10 or a little bit older, gerbils start to be a really good one. The main thing is that, like I mentioned, offering lots of enrichment, lots of space, lots of things to burrow in. Um, we love giving like pieces of driftwood and wooden hides here. Um, we try to make our exhibits as naturalistic as possible, whether that be for a reptile or a small mammal. So uh, with that, uh, I hope you guys learned a little bit about gerbils today. Um, and as always, if you have anything to add to it, go ahead and put it in there. Um, I do get some comments every once in a while, um, you know, like, hey, like, why are you using this product with it? Why are you having this enclosure? Everything we do is based off of what our veterinarian recommends and their exotic animal specialist. And then after that too, as long as like we have ample scientific evidence to back things up saying, hey, you definitively shouldn't offer this type of treat or this type of hide, or you shouldn't be using this color bulb or whatever else. We change with all that because the pet trade is obviously always evolving just like animals are evolving. We'll do what we can to make them good, but you always gotta come at it from a scientific mind. You have to have research to back up the things that we, that we want out of it, and that has to be researched, has to be tested, proven, tested again. Then from there, we go ahead and go on it, but I'm always willing to receive more information, um, and I'll always try to reply to you guys uh, when and if I can um, with uh, like my feedback on those types of things. So, hope you guys learned a lot. I know I always learn a lot because I always do a little bit of extra research before doing these videos and we'll see you guys next time.